Let me start here. All right. Uh, good morning. Well, now good afternoon, Tom. Uh, my name is Claudio. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., uh, from the studios in Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that Tom briefly accepted our invitation to our show. Tom is an American keyboardist, songwriter, singer, producer, and writer. Tom has performed and recorded for several of the biggest names in the classic rock, including jazz, mid-loaf, uh, David Harry from London. What about that? In 2019, joined uh, the legendary Kansas as a group keyboardist vocalist as well. And uh, Tom, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. It's good to be here. Man, um, with everything that's going on right now with with, with the pandemic, the bands cannot tour anymore. How you how you manage to be uh, at home and how you uh, how it's affecting your creativity in many ways now that you cannot. I look back at the year 2019 and I ask myself, how did I do it? Yeah. Joining Kansas, learning all that music, incredible music and complex, deep music for this big show that we were doing all year. Yeah. And then having this opportunity to write with the band for the album and to record the album. Uh, it's, it's interesting that I guess for me, it's w when the schedule is more dense I just know what I'm supposed to do and I just get into it and I'm just working, working, working and not really thinking about it. It's times like these when we had to pause and all of a sudden it's like I'm given all this time, but now it's up to me to, to do what I can with it, with the limitations that we all have. So I've just tried to get down here and write every day and play every day. And I've got a lot of music uh, ready to, to dig into, to develop into songs and, some of them could be for Kansas uh, yeah. for a future re potential release. Uh, some of them are a bit more pensive, a bit more of like what I did on my solo album, Hurry Up and Smell the Roses. And some are like modern rock. It it's like I have so many influences that I just write first and then figure out what I got later and, and see if it can, it can thrive somewhere. I got you. Great. Thank you. Man, we can take this uh, interview in so many directions. I mean, you have... Yes, Midloaf, uh, David Harris, Renaissance, man, uh, The Sea Within, uh, Camel, and John Anderson. Wow, man, what a background, man. So, but let, let's go back to the beginning. Were you born in a musical family? And how old were you when you began, uh, I don't know, keyboard, maybe a piano? You did have a home, a, 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 a piano at home or a keyboard? Or how everything started for you? Music was a big, if not the central element of our home growing up. There's a piano in the house and my siblings who are older than me, they played music. Some of them play piano, some play guitar. And I was always exposed to music and the piano was something I was always drawn to. So they started teaching me at a young age how to get around on the piano. And I think almost as importantly, I discovered their record collections and was just so fascinated by the record player and how it worked. And got into all their music, which just so happened to be 70s rock. So that well, was my pedigree. Stuff. Yeah, stuff. Uh, and then from there, it was like, I was waiting for one of my sisters to hand me down her old FM clock radio and start searching for the stations. And that's when I started discovering the music of the day, early 80s for myself. And so there was always that, that influence of the 70s rock, which is the first music I remember really hearing and loving. Mm -hmm. And then the 80s music, on the radio that was the first music I discovered for myself and that's always been a big part of what informs my musicianship and I think that I, I was writing songs before I could even really read or <laughs> play the music I was drawing album covers and really? writing song names and yeah because I love the album jackets of all these bands yeah. and just learning yeah. that there was this yeah. team of musicians, like yeah. a sports team. Everyone had their role or a superhero team. They had their role. How does this affect a kid, you know? And I always refer back to that. And I started forming bands, you know, a few years later, because I, I then eventually went to take piano lessons in town. And at the same time, I was trying to figure things out on my own by ear and the writing was always another thing I found very, very interesting. Were, were your parents supported that, you know, he's a little guy, listen to, you know, his brother, sister record and drawing and, you know, having the piano, you know, we, we met, we should put him in a, in a piano lesson or something like that. Were, were you were supportive for that 
No. Definitely. I, I provided hours of entertainment <laughs> for the family. Yeah. For free. Well. But yeah, no, they were really supportive and very interested uh, all the way through, you know, when I started playing in bands and needed them to take me somewhere to go to a rehearsal or a jam session or even a gig because I, I was starting to gig before I could drive. And it wow. was they, they were very helpful to me and they humored me, but they, they saw that I... I'm really fortunate that I had this sort of clear sense of purpose from a young age. I just had a feeling this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. And it's what I love to do. And it's what I, I kind of need to do. Weird, but it was so at the beginning when you begin forming your first band and you begin playing in gigs and before you have your driver license, your parents saw that uh, as a hobby or at one point you, you told the parents, well, should, I want to go to college, but at the same time, you know, the music thing is very important to me. I want to give it a try. If it doesn't work out, I could go back to college and then, you know, put my life back together. What they, 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 it was, you did have pressure to go to college and like college is the only way or, you know, you're not a professional musician, so, or, you know, how you, how you make the decision. Or, or. They didn't pressure me to go to college but uh i guess life sort of did in a way everybody around me was was planning on that and i had the opportunity to do it so it was kind of shown as a good future because it's a we're a practical family you know pretty modest upbringing and they just wanted to make sure that i would do all right so they just if anything just reminded me to keep an open mind and keep my eyes open and be realistic because i mean everybody in the world says you can't do music as a career that's not realistic you need to do something more realistic and but i see people doing it all the time and why not me if i if i worked hard enough and and i was i followed through and used whatever talent i had and 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 followed through on it to develop it and to show up um so i i had this real mission to almost prove prove the naysayers wrong that you can, but that meant that I, I said yes to every possible gig that came my way, whether it paid or it didn't, and no matter what kind of music it was. Because one of my heroes is Herbie Hancock, and I remember him saying that he always strove to be a versatile musician, and so that word versatile always stuck in my head. And I thought, okay, well, I'll be versatile. I'll, I'll go play play at a restaurant, I'll play in a punk band, I'll play in a rock band, I'll play uh, in a church, I'll play in a wedding band. And, and anytime the phone rang, I was I was ready to go. Even if I was out of my element, I, I would just do it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a big difference uh, between you and other people that I have met or I interview with. Uh, you, you have uh, an inner calling, you, you were perseverant, you know, and you, you did wedding, uh, you did dancing, with, like you mentioned, where they pay you or not, and your parents were supported. That's a big difference, right? So, you know, if you have it in the piano or any instrument, a lot, you know, and you take classes, form a class, and then you, you begin engaging with different older people like you, and eventually you will make it. Maybe you, you wouldn't make it to the level at where you are right now. You need to be very good. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. You need, you need to the, the, the to have the self-discipline, the right element, uh, the family engagement as well, but you need to be good and you you were good man, as well. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, that's impressive. You remember the first band and the, that you form? And well, I don't know if we form. count the one where we were all 10 years old, but uh, it, it was funny. We just, anybody who could play an instrument, even those who couldn't just join the band, you know? If right. you could, I mean, some people were writing lyrics or coming up with ideas yep. and, it was, it, you know, we, we were limited by the fact that some of us didn't even have instruments. We all had to come over to my house because that's where the piano was. And I didn't have a keyboard yet. And yeah. following, you know, and, and that, that lasted for a few weeks and then it went away. And then a couple of years later, some of the same people it, when we were 13 said, hey, let, let's let's get into this. Let's form a band. And then started reading the magazines with all the gear and all the interviews and and just from that, from that point, from the time I was about 13 years old, had, there's been a straight trajectory to now. 
there's never been a break. I've always either been in a band, started a band, joined a band, worked on the next thing, wrote music, started getting into electronics and MIDI and going to all the workshops and anything that a music store would have. And it's just been one thing after another. There's, there's been a, a, a straight trajectory. Do you remember the first keyboard and the first vinyl record that you bought on your own? If well, the first record that I remember hearing was the first Foreigner album. And um, maybe it's not the first one I heard, but it's the first one that I identified and checked out and listened to repeatedly and understood the songs and the band members and all that stuff. Yeah. But the first album that I bought with my own change was Men at Work, Business as Usual. I still remember riding my bike up to the store being, I don't know, nine years old or something. You couldn't do that now. <laughs> We, we did a lot of things on our own back then. Yeah, not anymore, and, man. Yeah, and I remember purchasing the, the the vinyl album. And of course, as soon as I put it on, I, I scratched it. <laughs> it started skipping. <laughs> But uh, eventually I got another copy. And then uh, when it came to keyboards, you know, my parents gave me a, a small portable keyboard for Christmas one year when I was about 11. And, and that definitely got me interested. But again, was about, I don't know, 13 years old. And I had saved up any, any money I could. I remember buying this Yamaha synthesizer, the DX27 was called. And it was the, a, a Yamaha synthesizer that mere mortals could afford, especially, you know, teenagers. And it was a complex, complicated, not a user-friendly instrument, but it made me explore. And since it was the only thing I had, I learned about synthesis, I learned about the terminology, and I figured it out how to start kind of creating my own sounds. Uh, whether or not they were any good, I, I don't know, but it was something. Yeah, so you save enough money to bear, but by the first one, then, then you continue earning a little bit of money, and you got the second one, and probably yeah, you first sold the first one, and then little by little, like everybody, right? So. And, and it's always one other thing, right? You know, we then realize, oh, and if I'm going to be able to play this at uh, band practice, I need an amplifier. <laughs> so then there's the next thing, you know, got to go yeah. for. Now I start lusting after an amplifier. And it's, it's uh, that's how the gear lust starts, out right. of necessity. Right. And then uh, now if you go back, I, I will go back and forth for reasons that I will explain here. And then your first concert took, took place uh, with Midloaf, right? You were with Midloaf between... 98 and 201, right? Yes. How in the world you end up getting there? It's a big, big band. Like how you, you were paying you, your dues at the time. And you were yeah, I, I, it's interesting that the way that the, the story unfolds because yeah. while I was, after I graduated from university, I was saying, okay, well, while I'm pursuing this uh, path with an original rock band, which doesn't bring an in income. What can I do around it? I could still play all those club dates and weddings and everything, but they would kind of compete for the same prime time slots on the weekends and things like that. So what could I do during the week? Okay, I can teach piano. And, and I, I actually have been started teaching my friends piano when I was in high school. And so I liked doing that. So I, I started teaching lessons and then uh, some people heard about me through that. And the other gigs and word of mouth would eventually lead me to uh, joining Glenn Burtnick's band. And he's a the popular New Jersey singer songwriter, has written many hit songs and uh, was a member of Styx at one point. And he brought me on for his solo band. And I came in there with that. I was a, you know, a sounds geek. So I wanted to recreate all the sounds on his album. And I don't think he was expecting that. So I, I think I, I, you know, I got in good with with glenn and we had a really good working relationship and i start he used to host uh, christmas shows he still does christmas benefit shows where all different um well-known singers and songwriters come to to play a song it's a big variety show and eventually he referred me to chasm sultan who was meatloaf's musical director at the time and i got an audition when i was 24 so it was again it was a Uh, going from one group and just trying to do my best with that to the next. And uh, I got the audition and got a Meatloaf's band. And next thing you know, I have this huge television camera in my face and we're doing the VH1 Storytellers special. That was my first performance with Meatloaf was on television. <laughs> well, man, so now you, 
your parents at the time they said, well, this guy's doing all right, you know, that's a big name band, you know, he hasn't got in trouble and he went incremental stages and uh, you begin working, making more money now so you could afford a better instrument and uh, get a car <laughs> or something. <Right. laughs> yeah. Man, unbelievable, man. And then, so the big break came when, um, so how, see what's happened is, you have, okay, so now if I look back now, right, you you have played with jazz, with Camo, um, you know, Kansas, man. I don't know what's the next step up, man, for you, right? I, 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 maybe Genesis, maybe you <laughs> played with Tony Vance. Well, people, let me tell you, uh, this is... Peter Gabriel, you know? You plan yeah. your stuff? I mean, when you were... It, 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 uh, you want to, I mean, you, you can play with a lot of, and they will, I know we'll touch the cancer stuff, but you can, eventually you want to form your own band. You, you, you plan your stuff. My, my next step after cancer, two, three years with cancer, I want to record several records. And, and then the next, I want to apply to go somewhere else or, or, or it so happen. The only things in my musical career that I've attempted to plan yeah. are, plans for my own music. I had a band called Spiraling. We were originally called You Were Spiraling and we did a coast to coast tour supporting They Might, they might Be Giants and Violent Femmes. And then we became Spiraling and, and got more of a refined, like sort of a power pop band. And my goals and my plans were really centered around that group because it was all my songwriting. I had this, the creative vision and, but that also meant that I had to wear these other hats. You know, next thing you know, me and the, the band members are booking our own tours and sorting out our own hotels. So then I become a tour manager. I've become a record producer. Uh, I've become a publicist. It, it, it's all, that was all sort of centered around spiraling being the, the passion and, and the original group thing. In the meantime, I was getting work, like I was mentioning with Glenn Burtnick or these other types of um, hired gigs. And what what happened was those were sort of starting a parallel track of my career. So I would try to do my best with that and then come home and pour it all into my original work. And it worked out to a degree because I was a side person. You know, I was hired by meatloaf to to play his music the way it was designed to be played and i i also did an album with him called couldn't have said it better from there yes called and they said we need someone for one year because rick is going to come back in the following year and i, I grew up loving yes they were they were my favorite band and so i had to jump on that and its temporary nature actually was something that suited me because my band knew that I would be coming back. And right after my time with Yes Symphonic on, you know, on tour in 2001, uh, after that, jumped right back into spiraling. What happened is, once you play with Yes, prog rock people start to notice and <laughs> prog rock bands start to notice, especially since the rumor had it that I, I got the Yes uh, material ready in a relatively short amount of time. There wasn't a, a whole lot of um, time to to work it out. Maybe a month, I think. That which you know, but I had to really knuckle down. I mean, this is yes music. This isn't just playing a bar band gig. So that's when Camel needed somebody for their U.S. leg of their. At the time, it was called the farewell tour, and they said we don't have a lot of time to prepare. Tom to the rescue. Uh, so I, I jumped in on that and had a couple really memorable and uh, shows with Camel, who I was admittedly not ter terribly familiar with them on an intimate level, you know, so I had to really study up on what they were about uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then that was that was done. That was defined. Here's what we need for and then it's going to end, you know, so I was like kind of uh, doing these things. And then jump back right back into spiraling, make another album, do another tour. So with Meatloaf, with Yes, we and Cam we'd play these beautiful venues. I'd be on the tour bus. We'd be going to Europe and 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 doing all that stuff. And then I would come home and jump in the van and go play a club with spiraling uh, with a bill of five bands. I was just so determined to get our music out and and try to get us. Um, somewhere with the group and it's hard because in the 2000s you know rock original rock, it was it was starting to decline record sales were starting to pull back labels were getting more nervous as a as a 
as it pertains to what kind of acts they were going to sign. And we were a little different. So it wasn't in the cards for spiraling. But this reputation I started getting from the prog scene carried forward to the sin and Francis Dunnery and Renaissance. Again, my, jo- my, my role in Renaissance was to recreate the orchestra parts. Yeah. So that's what I did with them. And it was really fun and very really interesting experience to, to be an orchestra. Yeah. Gotcha. That, yeah well, so we, you all kind of ping pong back and forth. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I, I interviewed Annie Haslam uh, like two months ago. And she was very nice. And really. So how in the, so how difficult was to audition and get the job with Jen? I mean, with Jen, not with Jen, with Jess to begin with, uh, how difficult it was because you were, Come on, you were 28 years old. And, and Not even yet. Huh? <laughs> I wasn't even 28 yet when they called. Well, 20, and people assume, yeah, guys or girls will work a whole life, man, to get a, you know, a gig with them. Never mind being a you know, member for a year or whatever it happens. How, how, you ended, how was the audition? How did it, how did it go? How did it well, the, the referral from some in the meatloaf camp it it gave a lot of weight because i mean meatloaf you might not think of his music as progressive rock but it is no joke and it is it demands a lot of attention to play because it's very it's very and and stamina too it's very muscular music you're just kind of jerry lee lewis all night and then but then the tempo stops and there's a pause dramatic effect and and music changes gears so in that sense it, it does where should I start again? <laughs> uh, so we were talking about how in the world you got the, the job with, with Jess, the, uh, how you auditioned for the job, how difficult to get the job. And you mentioned that, you know, coming from mid-loaf, obviously open doors, right? So. Yeah, because they, they had some trust that I would take business because yeah. meatloaf's music demands a lot of attention to detail and preparation. And that's a lot of what goes into progressive rock. It, and and also the sounds i have to program the sounds and sometimes musicians will have a person do that for them i tried my best to to get as close to it as possible even before i got the gig and show them that i was a multi keyboardist which is what yes demands multi key someone who understands not just piano not just organ not just synthesizers but all of them and so that referral and the trust that I got got me to the point where they just wanted me to make a CD for them playing two songs, two yes songs. They would send me a live recording from their previous tour and I would record myself on the left speaker and then their stuff on the right speaker so they could just turn the balance and hear my isolated performance and then they could bring the balance back to hear how I meshed with the band. Now I say there's two songs, right? But this is yes. So the two songs are close to the edge and the gates of delirium. I mean, that's 40 minutes. That's 40 minutes of music. (laughs) So, um, but I get it because if you go for the jugular, like they did, they know that if I could handle that, then I could handle anything else that they would require of me. And so I, I did that recording and they liked the recording. And then I came out to, visit them while they were recording the magnification album Uh, and that was a big part that was the other part of the audition was the hang they had to see that i would mesh well with them on a personal level since we'd be working together and living together on the road plus they saw you well you were a songwriter and you have a very good voice so they say well you know it's three for one you know because you 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 brought more than just playing keyboard you know uh, once once they learned that I was also a singer, then they they had some fun with that, especially Chris Squire. He wanted me in on every harmony. Even if there weren't enough harmony parts to go around, he'd have me double his part. He just wanted, yeah. he was always about the lush vocals and the, that, that huge backing vocal sound. That was really a passion of Chris's. And so I had my hands full, literally, with the keys and then had to sing back up at the same time. <laughs> and, and with your John Anderson as well. I mean I know and and to 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 hear my voice as I'm singing it to hear it with John Anderson and Chris Squire Chris surrounding me uh, I can't even explain that. But it was pretty incredible. Yeah, my, my god, man. And you knew 
you knew that Rick Wakeman was coming back the year after or so, right? So you knew that this this is only one week for one year, right? But yeah, so on the back of your mind, you say, well, the, I'm getting paid good money and this is the, one of the best band in the world. And that uh, background and putting that in my resume, so to speak, will open a lot more doors. So you, you, yeah, felt you needed to do it. You, and, and also to to live in the moment as much as possible and to to take a, take a notice of what I was experiencing. Because even though, you know, luckily I had pro touring experience under my belt by that point. So there wasn't this shock. I wasn't starstruck or anything like that. I knew what the job entailed and I, I was getting down to business. But there were some times when I was on stage and I was looking around and almost felt like I was in a virtual reality awesome. simulation, like, oh, yes, simulator. Like, here's what it would be like and I'm looking up and Alan White's over here and I'm looking over here and Steve Howe's there and I look down and there's keyboards everywhere and I got to hit my marks. And to see John Anderson uh, from this point of view, I still remember exactly how my stage vantage point was to, to sight lines to everyone in the band. Uh, so yeah, it was just, the I think the finite nature of that made me double my efforts to pay attention and to soak it all in. Do you remember the first show you did with them? And were you nervous, uh, like the night before? Or I would say when it comes to me, all the nerves that I ever experienced have to do with technical things. Like, is this keyboard malfunctioning? <laughs> is, is there something, you know what I mean? It's like, is there a technical thing that's going to pop up that I have to fight? As long as I prepare musically, I, I, I feel like that I have control over. I can, I can control how much preparation I do for a show. Um, that doesn't mean it's a guarantee that everything will go off without a hitch, but there are things that the things that are out of my control, a sound problem, would my, my ear monitor stop working? Would you know, because you're dealing with technology and you have to give it up and hope that it, it performs as it's supposed to. Um, and also, I think one of the big things, especially since here we are, this is yes music, it's very densely orchestrated, even before the orchestra is in there. And then the orchestra comes in and now you have such a tremendous uh, amount of sound to balance. And I just need to hear what's important for me to play the song effectively. And that's the thing that takes a little time is to work with the sound engineer and say, okay, I need a little more of this. I need a little more of that. And it varies from song to song. So it's about feeling comfortable and being able to hear everything because a rock and roll stage is not the optimal listening environment. There's sound everywhere. And we had plexiglass perspex separating the, the orchestra from the band. And um, it was a lot to handle. And then meanwhile, I'm like, okay, I got to make sure that I'm, I'm hitting it with gates of delirium or go close to the edge. You cannot, you cannot drift mentally for an instant or else you're, they leave you behind. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And I believe that uh, in that, that album uh, the, the, from the Symphonic Tour in 2001, they, that's one of the albums that end up getting uh, jazz inducted to the whole thing, right? The rock and roll whole thing. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. Um, I think one of, that was one of the albums that they mentioned that Based on that work, they end up in, I think, a 217 um, oh, wow. inducted. Uh, and that was one of the key. You were part of that, that album, man. Eh? Well, yeah, tour, it was, and it was a fun experience. And you know, speaking of the Hall of Fame, the Yes fans had their own celebration at the, at the same weekend as the Hall of Fame induction. And, and I was there to play the solo set. And Patrick Moraz was there. And ah, Patrick Moraz, yeah. Should, yeah, so it's like a lot of the alumni were re were uh, shown the love by the fans. So that's that's one great thing. You know, the Yes Fan community has been really supportive of everything I've done since. And then after that that year, you went back to your own spiraling uh, band, yeah. right? Yeah, we released an album called Transmitter. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was really me pouring everything into into uh, that endeavor is piling is it still exist i mean it's a parallel you you we, we never officially retired <laughs> but we we stopped performing regularly in 2008 again we it, it it's not easy for an independent band if if uh, uh you need to catch some breaks and i'm proud of what we did we got to see some things that not a lot of bands get to 
experience. We played in Japan. We played all over the United States. We've had, you know, thousands of people hear our music. So that was the victory there, but it was time for...